After four college girls rob a restaurant to fund their spring break in Florida, they get entangled with a weird dude with his own criminal agenda. Comedies, dark comedies. <laughs> um, look, I get it. Some films are difficult to describe, let alone with just 26 words. And we all know that accurate synopses are not Netflix's highest priority. But this one is pretty bad, both because it misleadingly connects to entirely unrelated events in the movie, and because it seems to have been written by someone who thinks that flippancy is inherently clever. It's not. Comedies? Maybe whomever it was who wrote the description just deeply misunderstood what they had seen. Hello, and welcome to the week I review. My name is, uh, never been to Cancun. Today, I'm celebrating the fact that Columbia University is on spring break, so my neighborhood has cleared out by talking about Harmony Corinne's 2012 masterpiece, spoiler, Spring Breakers. In the hypothetical Netflix synopsizer's defense, it's not hard to misunderstand Spring Breakers, a movie that follows four young women who spend more time in bikinis than not, a movie that opens with topless men and women living their best lives on a spring break beach as Skrillex's scary monsters and nice sprites wub wubs over it all. Power fantasy, where guns never run out of bullets. A few months ago, I showed Spring Breakers to my currently in-college sister, and she really fixated on that last bit in the same way that the film fixates on guns in general. There are a lot of guns, real and fake, in Spring Breakers. At first, they're impressions for suicidal imagery. The girls are locked into their boring college lives, uh, point finger guns at their head and pull imaginary triggers. Brit drinks from the barrel of a loaded squirt gun. Scenes transition with the sounds of guns cocking or firing. They echo across the soundscape. So even when you don't see them, you feel them. And then all of a sudden, they're everywhere and they are everything. See, Spring Breakers understands the truly fetishistic relationship that America has with guns, the way that their killing power has been almost sexualized by our culture. And the camera loves the guns just as much as it loves the girls holding them, which is a lot. So what starts off feeling like a lost Girls Gone Wild tape ends up a fever dream symphony of sex and violence just daring you, the viewer, to get swept up. But the actual construction of the film makes it difficult to do that. I haven't seen many genuinely good films that were as clearly formed in the edit as Spring Breakers. Of course, every film is made three times, on the page, on set, in the edit. But a movie like this can only exist with hindsight. No one. Not even Harmony Corinne could have known what Spring Breakers would become. And I'm not just saying that in some pathetic attempt to sound insightful. I know it for an actual fact because I read the script. You can too. While A24's original link is gone, I can point you in the proper direction down below. I highly recommend it if you have seen the film or not, because it really does show just how much can change over the course of a production. The imagery, by and large, is intact. I would call Corinne's imagery grotesquely evocative. But the context is so different. Scenes are in different order or even on top of each other. There are flashes forward and backward. Dialogue is repeated, but with different inflections pulled, I assume, from multiple takes given different direction. These are not, by and large, in the script. Indeed, most of the dialogue appears to have been improvised because there is a whole lot less on the page and the stuff that is there feels less human. It's, it's kind of awkward. I'm, I'm glad they were allowed to riff. But none of that comes across. Those strange edits sometimes feel almost arbitrary in the moment, but taken collectively, they are so gosh darn impactful. Because they serve 
this broader purpose of telling you a lie and showing you the truth. Now, doing this is not unique to Spring Breakers, but Spring Breakers does it uniquely well. It's worth noting that there was a metatextual aspect to Spring Breakers at the time of release that is lost now. Back then, putting Selena Gomez, Ashley Benson, and Vanessa Hudgens in roles like this was scandalous. To some, it probably felt like they were overcompensating for kid-friendly images by taking part in this very not kid-friendly film. Indeed, them, alongside co-star Rachel Corinne, wife of the writer-director, which I just like to say for the record, is super weird. Were co-nominated for the Alliance of Women Film Journalists Actress Most in Need of a New Agent Award that year, though they ultimately lost to Cameron Diaz for The Counselor. Time has now passed and images have changed, and so it's not so strange that these actors would play these roles. But let's be honest, it was always flawless casting. Every one of the four characters is perfectly realized by its actor, with Vanessa Hudgens as Candy, I think, being the particular standout. But Spring Breakers takes these four attractive young women, puts them in bikinis, and then lets them loose into pure debauchery. It is objectifying them in the context of their own story. And if you turn the sound off, you might think that was all it was doing. But then you listen to Gomez's faith calling her grandmother and talking about how beautiful the thing you're seeing supposedly is and how she wishes they could go together. What a wonderful time it would be. In the script, there's a knowing smile, but it is played perfectly straight on screen, and it's far more effective for that change because Faith's own conviction in the magic of the Florida beaches is what shows how horrific all of this really is. That sound both adds the necessary drama to make the scene function and also makes clear that this celebratory imagery is not so celebratory. It's gross, and it knows it. All that ogling the camera is doing starts to feel more like an attack on the audience. Again, a dare to get caught up in everything before it all comes crashing down. The spell begins to break even before the introduction of James Franco's Alien, a genuinely terrible rapper whose actual business is drugs and murder. He bails the girls out from prison after they're arrested alongside two of his own posse at a particularly crazy spring break party that had nothing to do with the chicken shop robbery, and he just wants to be with them. They're attractive and in need. He wants to be their knight in shining armor. In return, they get spring break forever. But the reality of that is terrifying and dangerous. And so one gets scared and another gets hurt. And they go back to their old lives despite aliens' protests. The remaining girls hug them goodbye and then they board a bus and watch the world go from what I can assume is I-95. In the end, there are only the true believers, and they herald in a new kind of truth for the film, a future is female kind of truth, as Brit and Candy show the world that nothing will stop them from living in spring break forever. The film becomes their dream as they ascend to power using the tools at their disposal, both natural and man-made, and it's glorious. Which is why I actually think Spring Breaker's biggest problem was its release date. Had this film come out in, say, 2017 instead of 2013, I think the conversation around it would have been very different. And more interesting, because Spring Breakers feels like a movie of the current moment, one that feeds into the chaotic and angry world and culture that we are living in now, one that points a literal gun at the male gaze while still embracing it. It's a big, beautiful mess of a film that demands and rewards repeat viewings, and I love it. I love it so much. 9.5 out of 10. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, that is great. Uh, pro tip, don't uh, change razor blades with one hand. There'll be a lot of blood. Um, uh
If you didn't like the video, I'm sorry. If you want to see more, please subscribe. I hope to see you next week.